We live in a world that few, if any, people understand. For example, Dan Davidson has produced a book entitled Shape Power. In it he points out that nine wooden chopsticks pushed into a styrofoam ball produces both an electrostatic field and a magnetic field. This is due to the effect of converging straight lines and it is impressive that these non-magnetic components can produce a magnetic field. Are you aware that a carefully constructed coil of wire attached between the chassis of a car and a wire pushed down into the sump oil instead of the oil dipstick can give a 25% improvement in the miles per gallon travel by the vehicle. How would you explain that? Here's how the coil can be wound. The initial set of coils were wound on a 7 8 inch, that's 22 millimeter diameter, stainless steel tubing, which happened to be to hand. The use of stainless steel is not significant, and two successful replicators have used half inch, that's 12 millimeter, PVC plastic pipe, as using a non-ferrous material is the main requirement. Strictly speaking, I think we should say using a non-magnetic material is the main requirement, but anyway. The wire diameter has an effect, and while a 20 gauge, that's 0.812 millimeter diameter enamel copper wire, was used for the coils shown here, wound with 12 gauge, 2.05 millimeter diameter copper wire, works much better, and it is now thought that the weight of copper in the winding is important. For the first layer, a length of 311 centimeters is used, and wound on the former in a clockwise direction. The ends of the wire are secured with tape, leaving three or four centimetres of wire exposed at each end of the coil, and that's for connecting the coils afterwards. This is the first layer wound and secured. The wire for the second layer is cut to a length of 396 centimetres. This second coil layer will be longer than the first layer, so before winding it, it is necessary to build up the area at both ends of the first layer with tape. So the first layer is sitting on the former and then there's a layer of tape wound around the former itself to block off the end of the pipe which will be uh, underneath the next layer of wire. This is so that the second layer of wire will have the same diameter along its entire length. It is probably a good idea to completely cover the first layer of wire with tape to ensure good electrical insulation. So uh, you put an a layer of wire, sorry, a layer of tape over the wire all the way along the first layer. And when you've wound the second layer, you put a layer of tape all along the second layer. The second layer is also wound in a clockwise direction. The wire for the third layer is cut to a length of 313 centimeters, since it will be covering less length along the former. There's no need to build up the ends of the earlier layers, so simply cover the second winding with tape and then wind on the third layer. But this time, the coil is wound in a counterclockwise direction, and then the entire coil is covered in tape to protect it. To be sure that the second and third layers are centered over the earlier layer, it's a good idea to locate the center of the wire and start winding from the middle outwards in both directions. So the arrangement shows the windings here, and their different lengths and the position that they are on the non-magnetic former. In the testing, the negative end was connected to chassis ground, 
and the positive end is just a wire inserted down into the dipstick tube. This gave about a 25% reduction in the fuel used by an old Honda Accord car with an electronic fuel injection system. This design was suggested by Dave Lawrence in 2011. So are you still sure that you understand the world around you? Next we come to the shape called a pyramid. In Canada, Les Brown grows vegetables and fruit inside a pyramid and that gives him four to six crops each year in spite of the harsh climate there. Each crop is spectacular with each tomato plant which gave 10 to 14 pounds of tomatoes uh, outside uh, the pyramid they are now giving 40 to 50 pounds uh, inside the pyramid and there are similar gains with other fruit and vegetables. So exactly how do we explain that improvement? This is a picture of the actual pyramid in use and there is a person standing to give you the feeling of the scale involved. The shape is that which matches the dimensions of the Great Pyramid who faces slope at an angle of 51 degrees, 51 minutes and 10 seconds. Pyramids with other slopes will work but not quite as well. If you would like to make one yourself and test the effects then the proportions are the base is 20 units long, the sloping sides are 19 units long and that gives a height which is 16.18 for a 20 unit um, triangle is that is the uh, height at the midpoint of the base is 1.618 times the actual base length that is the golden ratio which is so inherent to so many things on earth. Pyramid users also state that they find the following effects on a consistent basis provided that a pyramid is kept away from strong electromagnetic fields that is. First fruit is preserved. When a purchase of fresh fruit or vegetables is made if they are placed under a pyramid for about an hour and then stored as they normally would, it is said that they stay fresh for at least twice as long as normal and the flavour is enhanced. It is believed that um, unhelpful microorganisms are killed by the pyramid. If the fruit and vegetables are kept indefinitely under the pyramid, they eventually dry up instead of rotting. Secondly, food quality is enhanced. If frozen meat, fish or fowl is thawed out under a pyramid, the quality of the meat is said to be noticeably improved. Quality of coffee is also improved. If a cup of coffee is left under a pyramid for about 20 minutes, it is said to gain a much more mellow flavour. Leaving ground coffee or a jar of instant coffee under a pyramid overnight is also said to change it so that the coffee made from it is of a much higher quality. A glass of wine placed under the pyramid for 20 minutes is said to undergo a distinct change with great improvement seen in both the taste and the aroma. Other alcoholic drinks are also said to be improved by this process. A 20 to 30 minute treatment of fruit juices is said to reduce the acidic bite of the drink and in many cases alter the colour of the juice. Any item pickled in vinegar such as olives and pickles gain a greatly enhanced natural flavour and are greatly mellowed by the process. The rapid growth of mould on cheddar cheese can be overcome by the cheese being kept under a pyramid at normal room temperature. It's recommended that the cheese be wrapped in plastic to reduce the rate at which it dries out. 
rice and wheat can be kept in open jars under a 12 inch open frame wire pyramid for at least four months without any form of deterioration or infestation by insects or flies which are repelled by the energy inside the pyramid. A test was run outdoors with a six foot base pyramid with food placed in the centre to attract ants. It was found that the ants heading for the food followed a curved path out of the pyramid without ever reaching the food. Water left under a pyramid is altered. Cut flowers placed in it tend to last 30% longer than normal, while growing plants watered with it grow more strongly and are hardier. The water appears to hold the energy indefinitely. A glassful takes 20 minutes. A quart, which is two pints, takes one hour, and larger amounts should be left overnight. Animals given the choice of pyramid water or untreated water almost always choose the treated water. In the 1940s, Vern Cameron of America discovered that the beneficial pyramid energy could be transmitted. He placed a pyramid at each end of a row of plants, connected a wire to the apex of each pyramid, and ran the wire underneath the plants. He placed a clump of steel wool on the wire under each plant. The pyramids were aligned north-south, and he found that even better results were obtained if the row of plants was also aligned in a north-south direction. There are reports of instances where dogs suffering from old age, lameness and hair loss have been cured and rejuvenated in about six weeks by the use of a pyramid. From these many details we can see that there is an energy field which is life-sustaining but so little is known about it, that field that we have not yet been able to tap into its power effectively. If we erect an aerial and connect one end to the ground then this field power runs down or perhaps up the aerial wire and can be extracted reasonably well. Herman Clausen did that professionally and he describes a 100 kilowatt system as being a small system. That is, he put up aerials and the aerials provided uh, large numbers of kilowatts of power without any input being visible anywhere. Thomas Henry Moray did many demonstrations drawing up to 50 kilowatts of power out of the air and he even did one demonstration at a location chosen by skeptical people who ended up being fully convinced that what Moray said was fully correct and genuine. Interestingly, Moray's demonstration aerial war was only 20 meters long and his earth was an old gas pipe which was driven into the ground. A mobile form of extractor of this energy is called the Joe Cell. Bill Williams of America has run his Ford pickup truck for long periods without the vehicle using any petrol. According to scientific experts, that is impossible, and yet it happened. Joe Noble in Australia has run a vehicle some 2,000 kilometers without using any petrol either. The device called the Joe Cell used to be one of the most difficult devices for any experimenter to get operating properly. But new design data has changed all that. It is a passive device for concentrating energy drawn from the local environment. And it takes great perseverance and patience to use one to power a vehicle. Here is some practical information on the Joe Cell. In 1992 in Australia, Graham Coe, Peter Stevens and Joe Noble developed previously patented units which are now known by the generic name of the Joe Cell. Peter Stevens introduced Joe to Graham and they rehashed the patented cells which Graham knew about using materials from the local 
Dairy Production Facility, Norco. A two-hour-long video showing the Joe cell was produced by Peter and Joe, and the unit shown operating in the video was attached to Peter's Mitsubishi van. Joe had his equipment stolen and his dog killed, so he decided to keep a low profile, moving out into the wilds and not generating mu much publicity, in spite of fronting the two-hour video recording. A Joe cell is capable of powering a vehicle engine without needing to use conventional fossil fuel. So what does the engine run on? It runs on an energy field which is not yet understood by mainstream science. In another couple of hundred years, it will be routine subject which every child in school will be expected to understand, but today it looks like the witchcraft of a magnifying glass being used to start a fire on a sunny day. It's not unusual for newcomers to the subject to get confused by the cell itself. The cell consists of a metal container with tubes inside it. The container has what looks like ordinary water in it, and it sometimes has a DC voltage applied across it. This causes many people to immediately jump to the false conclusion that it is an electrolyzer. It isn't. The Joe cell does not convert water to hydrogen and oxygen gases to be burnt in the engine. The water in a Joe cell does not get used up no matter how far the vehicle travels. It is possible to run a car on the gases produced by electrolysis of water, but the Joe cell has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with electrolysis. The Joe cell acts as a concentrator for an unknown energy field, in the same way that a magnifying glass acts as a concentrator for sunlight, and both have to be done just right for them to work. At the present time there are at least 15 people who have built Joe cells and managed to power vehicles using them. Several of these people use their Joe sell powered vehicles on a daily basis. Most of these people live in Australia. The first cell powered vehicle was driven some 2,000 kilometers across Australia. We come now to a disclaimer. The remainder of this document contains considerable specific detail on the design and construction of a Joe cell. This presentation is for information purposes only and must not be construed as a recommendation that you actually physically construct a device of this nature. The author stresses that he is in no way liable for any damage, loss or injury caused by your future actions. It should also be borne in mind that any alteration to an automotive vehicle such as changing the fuel on which it runs, the HHO gas, natural gas, Joe cell energy or anything else, might avoid the vehicle insurance unless the insurer is informed beforehand and agrees to continue insurance cover on the modified vehicle. In broad outline, a Joe cell is a 316 L grade stainless steel container with a central, select, a central cylindrical electrode surrounded by a series of progressively larger stainless steel cylinders and f filled with specially treated water. The arrangement of steel shells and treated water acts as a focusing mechanism for the en energy field used to power the vehicle. The cell itself is made up with the battery negative taken to the central electrode, the connection to the stainless steel electrode is made at the bottom with the electrical connection passing through the base of the cell container. This obviously needs to careful construction to prevent any leakage of the conditioned water or the energy focused by the cell. Surrounding the central electrode are two or three cylinders made of either 
solid or mesh stainless steel. These cylinders are not connected electrically and are held in position by insulating material which needs to be selected carefully as the insulation is not just electrical insulation but it is also energy field insulation. The outside stainless steel cylinder forms the container for the cell. This is the way that it is actually connected. You've got the battery minus, which is co always connected to the chassis of the vehicle, going to the bottom of the central um, stainless steel uh, cylinder. The additional cylinders are not physically connected electrically or other any, any other way other than strictly mechanical to separate them and the specially conditioned water inside it makes a major difference. The unit is tightly sealed at the lid and there's an airtight connection made to an aluminium pipe. The aluminium pipe runs to the engine of the vehicle. In this di diagram it's shown as being connected to the carburetor inlet um, but please notice that you have to have a clear plastic tube or a plastic tube of some description for at least three quarters of an inch um, between the Joe cell and the carburetor inlet. Now that the reason for that is fairly obvious. The battery minus you have connected to the chassis and it's connected then through uh, the cell itself through to the uh, metal part of the engine which is also connected to the chassis. So you get a direct short circuit around that loop unless you have an insulator in it and you want the pipe to be aluminium coming across to the, en the engine or motor of the vehicle. So the way that you do the connections is uh, important for the actual functioning of the unit itself. When you're installing a Joe cell in a vehicle, the first step is to insulate the cell from the engine components. The insulation is not just electrical insulation, which is easily accomplished, but it is a case of introducing sufficient separation between the cell and the engine to stop the concentrated invisible energy leaking away instead of being fed to the engine through the aluminium tube. So wrap the cell walls in three layers of double laminated hessian sacking or burlap, pulling it tightly round the five inch diameter outer tube. Tie a minimum of three wooden dowels along the length of the cell and bend the mounting bracket around the dowels. The purpose of this is solely to ensure that there is at least a three-quarter inch, that's 18 millimeters, air gap between the walls of the cell and everything else, including the mounting bracket. The mounting details depend on the layout of the engine compartment. The really essential requirement is that the aluminium pipe running to the engine must be kept at least four inches, that's 100 millimeters, away from the engine electrics, radiator, water hoses and air conditioning components. At least the, the last four inches or so uh, of the tube going to the engine cannot be aluminium as that would cause an electrical short circuit between the positive outer connection to the outside of the cell and the engine itself which is connected to the battery negative. To avoid this the final section of the pipe is made using a short length of clear plastic piping forming a tight push fit onto the outside of the aluminium tube and on the connection to the intake of the engine's carburetor. There should be a three quarter inch, that is 18 millimeter gap, between the end of the aluminium pipe and the nearest metal part of the carburetor. If it is just not possible to get an airtight fit on the intake to the carburetor, 
and a hose pipe clamp has to be used, be sure that the fitting is non-magnetic stainless steel. If such a fitting can't be found, then improvise one yourself using only 316L grade stainless steel, that is food grade stainless steel. This is the Joe cell in this particular picture and the aluminium pipe going across to the engine. Uh, it's been kept well clear of everything um, as you can see from the shadow uh, being cast by the pipe itself shows you that it is con some considerable distance away from the physical metal of the engine. In the installation shown above you will notice the aluminium tube has been run well clear of the engine components. At a later date when the engine has been running with the cell and is attuned to it, the cell operates better if the pipe is connected to one of the bolt heads on the engine block, again using the plastic tube to make a gap between the aluminium tube and the bolt head. If it's still available, the YouTube video shown here shows Bill Williams operating his Joe cell. One of the greatest problems with using a Joe cell has been to get it operational. The reason for this has probably been due to the lack of understanding of the background theory of operation. This lack has been addressed at this time and a more advanced understanding of the device is being developed. These design dimensions cause ordinary tap water to go immediately to the fully functional conditioned state and remain in that state indefinitely. In fact, the only way of stopping the cell then is to physically take it apart. While it's still rather early to draw hard and fast conclusions, a number of results indicate that there are three separate, unrelated dimensions which are of major importance in constructing a properly tuned Joe cell. It needs to be stressed that these measurements are very precise and construction needs to be very accurate indeed, with one sixteenth of an inch making a major difference. The dimensions are specified to this degree of accuracy as they represent the tuning of the cell to the frequency of the energy which has been focused by the cell. These three dimensions have been assigned names and are as follows. There's the golden dimension, which is 1.89745 inches, or 48.195 millimeters. There's the blue dimension, which is 3.458 inches, or 87.833 millimeters. Then there's the di diamagnetic dimension, which is 0 0.515625 inches, or 13.097 millimeters. It is suggested that a Joe cylinder should be constructed with cylinder heights which are a multiple of either the golden or the blue length. Also, the water height inside the container should be below the tops of the inner cylinders and be a multiple of the base length chosen for the construction. The inner cylinders should be positioned the diamagnetic dimension above the base of the cell. They should also be constructed from stainless steel of thickness 1.637 millimeters, which is very close to 1 16th of an inch. And there should be a horizontal diamagnetic gap between all of the vertical surfaces. The inner cylinder should be constructed from stainless steel sheet, which is tack welded at the top and bottom of the seam. And all of the seams should be exactly aligned the lid should be conical and sloped at an angle of 57 degrees with its inner surface matching the inner surface of the uh, housing and the inner surface of the outlet pipe. The outer casing should not have any dome headed fasteners used in its construction. The length of the outlet pipe should be made of blue height cylinders sorry, I beg your pardon, the outlet pipe should be made of aluminium and should be 
385 millimeters for golden height cylinders or 527 millimeters for blue height cylinders. That is 8H for golden and 6H for blue. And should there be a need for a longer pipe, then those lengths should be doubled or tripled as the single dimensions no longer apply, this being a fractal effect. At this point in time, these are only suggestions as the science has not yet been firmly established. One possible arrangement is shown here. You have the dimensions given you there uh, in inches of the various cylinders. It's not necessary for there to be four inner cylinders so you could have the version shown here which has got three and again the dimensions are shown in inches. Um, a suggested Joe cell design is shown below. The design shows a cross section through a Joe cell with four inner, correct, four inner concentric stainless steel tubes. These tubes are positioned 13.097 uh, millimeters above the bottom of the cell and the gap between each of the tubes including the outer casing is exactly that same diamagnetic resonance distance. It should be clearly understood that a Joe cell has the effect of concentrating one or more energy fields of the local environment. At this point in time we know very little about the exact structure of the local environment, the fields involved and the effects of concentrating these fields. Please be aware that a dual cell which is properly constructed has a definite mental or emotional effect on people near it. If the dimensions are not correct then that c effect can be negative and cause headaches but if the dimensions are correct and the construction accurate then the effect on nearby humans is beneficial. This diagram is of course too large to see at one go on this particular presentation. You have a table here which shows the golden and blue values for the various um, dimensions and uses that it has. You have the outlet pipe which is aluminium going vertically off. You have a conical lid in stainless steel with a 57 degree slope and then you have the main body of the cell itself. Now the main body is as described from the earlier description of the construction with the gaps between all of the metal vertical pieces being 13.097 millimeters. The, there is a gap um, of that amount also between the bottom of the cylinders and the base of the cell itself. The Teflon is su suggested as the space or material and the tube thickness is taken to be 1.637 millimeters. It should be pointed out that Joe cells will be constructed with the materials which are readily to hand and not necessarily those with the optimum dimensions. If picking stainless steel sheet which is not the suggested optimum thickness, then a thinner rather than a thicker sheet should be chosen. In case the method of calculating the diameters and circum circumferences of the inner cylinders is not already clear, this is how it's done. And this section here shows and describes how the actual uh, diameters are, cal are worked out. And there's a table here giving you the actual results of the circumferences for the way that you would normally construct it. While the dual cell is all very well and potentially very useful, how is it that Tesla didn't know about this stuff? Well, actually he did. He had patents on extracting energy from aerials and as he knew that unlimited energy was available freely for use, 
he, he experimented and found that with very high voltage and very high frequency waves he could produce lighting without the need for a light bulb. Adjusting his apparatus he found that he could produce at a different frequency he heating without a heater and at a different frequency cooling without an air conditioning unit. Nathan Stubblefield was also aware of that and when he died they found his isolated cabin lit up without any obvious light source. So do you really feel that you understand the world that you live in?